you can have the best winemaker in the world, you can have the best facilities, high technology in your winery. The truth at the end is that without good raw material, without good fruit, there will be no miracles, you know. You have to have good raw material to make good wines. Great wine. Better prices. Delivered right to your door. SaratogaWine.com This is Charles Kirkwood from SaratogaWine.com and today we have the honor and privilege of being joined by Miguel Roquette of Quinta de Crosto. Miguel, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Charles. And to Saratoga mm -hmm. Company, it's a privilege and I'm really honored to be here uh, in the name of Crasto and all our, our family in the world. So if you could give us a, a, a brief background, uh, first on you, know, on you and, and how you came into the industry. Portugal and the, the wine world is very small, especially in Portugal, that is a small country. My, um, my second family name is Gedish. And I'm uh, cousins with uh, the Gedge family from Sobrap, which is the biggest okay. wine in Portugal. And also uh, with uh, Avaleda, which is a big property with Vinho Verde. My grandmother, she was born in Avaleda, so that was her property. Okay. Uh, also, my great-grandfather from my mother's side was a very, very famous uh, port shipper uh, mm -hmm. in, in the 40s, in the 50s. And on my father's side, his uh, oldest uh, brother owns uh, Esporão, which is a big winery in the south, in the Alentejo. I'm connected with, with the wine business from since, since my, my, my beginning. So I, I took a, a PhD in marketing in Portugal. I worked at, uh, first I worked with Sograp uh, for about one year. Okay. Then I moved to, um, I moved to Quinta do Noval, was, where I was commercial director until okay. Quinta do Noval was sold to the um, AXA, AXA Milesim group. Mm -hmm. And after that, I went to, I, I moved to San Diego and I finished my degree in 94. When I came back, uh, that's when we mainly, when we started our business. So we produced our very first uh, dry wine from Quinta do Crasto, uh, our Crasto Doro Red and also our Quinta do Crasto Reserva old vines. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the time we, you know, we, the production was very small. The property was, uh, was small. We had about 50 hectares planted at Crasto in those days. Uh, and the first vintage, the first production for dry wines, we, we made approximately 25,000 bottles. So it was very, very small. Nowadays, we have three different properties in the Douro. We uh, own 220 hectares. So that's roughly uh, 500 acres of vineyards. And right now, our production is around 1.6 million bottles. Okay. And of course, uh, I always say this, we, we were... We are and will always be uh, port shippers. But yeah. nowadays, Quinta do Crasto is ov obviously the, the the majority of the production is with um, with dry wines, whites, reds, of course. And rosé. Mm -hmm. Where in the evolution of, of, of the business did you decide to focus on on table wine? This was, um, I think, Charles. This was uh, this was something that had to do with uh, a lot with my father. He's still with okay. us. He's still alive. My father is eighty four still involved in the business, although more on the backstage now. But um, I, I think my father was, uh, was truly a visionary because he, he always believed that the future of the Douro would also be with, uh, with dry wines. This was a little bit crazy back then. Uh, it's important to mention that the Douro region, um, so for some of you that don't know, but the Douro is officially uh, the oldest wine region in the world. So it's the very first demarcation that happened in the Douro in 1756. And it was to control uh, the port trade. And, um, and in the 20th century, what happened with single quinta, so uh, quinta, it's a Portuguese word for uh, state or vineyard. And what happened in the, in the 20th century is that the single quintas, they were not allowed to, uh, to sell their own wines under their own labels. This was against the law. So single quintas in the door were mainly producing port wine. Keep in mind that uh, dry wines, uh, I usually say, the Douro is the oldest wine region in the world when it comes to port, but actually when it comes to dry wine, I think we can say that the Douro is probably the youngest wine region in the world because we have, uh, all of us, not just Krasto, but all of us, we have uh, 30 years of experience behind us. So in 94, we've decided to uh, do a, an experiment, see what happens, you know, and, uh, and adventure into dry wine. What we did, we asked our... Uh, my uncle in the south uh, uh, at the Shporão, 
if we if his winemaker could come up to help us you know with this uh, in this adventure and uh, at the time it was david baverstock australian winemaker working there mm -hmm. david came up and uh, he said you know he had experience in the doro before with port uh, working with the simmingtons um, and then we just, you know, we picked our grapes, we, we crushed them because we, we didn't have a crusher at the time. The crusher was, uh, was coming from Germany and was on a strike in, in France on the highway. So David said to us, you know, if we want to make some dry wine, we have to start now. So what we did for the first uh, Krafto Reserva, we actually crushed all the, all the fruit with our feet. Then the wines were fermented. And that was it. It was a small, um, a small, uh, a small start, if you will. Then what I've decided to do was to, um, well, to go to the, the export markets. Actually, for the first nine years, we didn't sell a single bottle of crushed wines in Portugal. So it was 100% export. And, and I chose to, um, to start our adventure, if you will, in the in UK market. UK is extremely okay. important. You have a lot of uh, influence. Oh, yeah. Huge press. It's a big market. It's connected to Portugal because of the port consumption mm -hmm. as well. And uh, and we've decided to open, you know, on trade, off trade accounts. We were just about everywhere. We were with Odd Beans, Adnams, Majestics. Uh, we were at Selfridges, Harvey Nichols. You know, just about everywhere. And the results were were impressive because uh, no one knew about Doro wines. And when you know when they were trying the Doro wine for the very first time, they were puzzled with the quality. You know, we <laughs> produced our very first single varietal, Toriga Nacional. In '95, yeah, uh, we I, I I managed to get some some samples to Jancis Robinson. She wrote half a page in the Financial Times about this wine, and this was something that no one knew. You know, uh, Doro was mostly known was known for port production. You know, dry wines in the Doro in the old days were always uh, second quality grapes. We would make some dry wine. So we we found we were very sure that the future of the Doro would also go through the through the dry wines and uh, and we started you know step by step it was a small uh, a small adventure but it, it worked quite well and nowadays we are in uh, 54 different markets around the world oh wow so it, it, things changed a lot things changed a oh, lot oh most certainly what inspires you the most you know whoever has been in the doro will understand this the doro is just a a magical place and that's the uh, i think my uh, the inspiration comes from there. I we just we have a our office, our main office is in in you know Porto, so close to the ocean, but we are one hour and a half uh, drive away. So every time I go there, you know, we just it, it's different, you know. And the Doro is one of those uh, places where you have uh, it's still very protected. It was declared as uh, World Heritage in two thousand and one. So mm -hmm. it's still very, very protected. In that sense, it's still very wild. You still have a lot of wildlife and nature, clean air. Um, and it's just uh, it's just there. Every time you go up there, it's just fantastic. Can you give us a brief overview of uh, the Douro as well as the layout of Crosta? Portugal is, as you know, we're at the end of the, the Iberian Peninsula. Most of Portugal is, uh, we have a coastline that runs for about 700 kilometers from the north all the way to the south, Atlantic. Then we have our islands, Madeira and, uh, and the Azores. Mm -hmm. And Portugal is quite small. Portugal is uh, 10 million, 10 million uh, uh, total population. And the Douro, so Douro River, Douro is a river. It starts in the north of Spain. Uh, it runs for about 900 kilometers all the way to the city of Porto. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the demarcated region, so the Douro region, uh, officially, in terms of total area, we have approximately 250,000 hectares. Uh, round numbers, we're talking about 500,000 uh, acres. Mm -hmm. This is the total area. But vineyards planted around 44,000, and this is very controlled. So we're talking about uh, roughly uh, uh, 100,000 acres planted in the, in okay. the vineyards throughout the region. And the Douro is divided in three sub-regions uh, with three tributary rivers, Lower Corgo, Upper Corgo, where Crash to East, and then as you go further east towards the Spanish border, that's what we call uh, Doro Superior. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, just for you to have an idea, Charles, just to give you that, I think this could be helpful. When we talk about 44,000 hectares, just to give an idea, this is uh, one third the area of Bordeaux that we have. Mm -hmm. 
so upper upper Bordeaux and lower Bordeaux. So it's one third smaller than Bordeaux. And uh, this is, has been very controlled. So nowadays it's very difficult for you to extend the vineyards in the Douro. You need to get licenses. And in order for you to plant here, you have to remove vineyards from other places. So it's not... Oh, wow. Uh, this is, I think this is important for the the quality of the wines and, mm. and everything that happens in the Douro. Douro is... Uh, it's the new... Uh, the new thing, it's the new hidden secret. Uh, everyone wants to come to the Douro. Also Portugal. Porto has been voted, well, we had the pandemic, of course, for two years, but Porto has been voted for three consecutive years as best uh, European destination. What makes, you know, Crosto stand out, do you feel? Well, um, I think the best way to answer that is this. You can, you, you look, when you look at, um, at uh, first of all, we are, uh, there's been a lot of changes in the door in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Krashto is still in in the original hands of the family. So uh, my my sons, uh, my nephews are the fifth generation. So Krashto has been, we have two very special dates for King to do Krashto. When you see our label or you get into the property, when you read on the, what you read on the front gate is two very special dates. One is 1615. And the other one is 1918. So 1615, uh, these are the very first references to our state. And Krasno okay. is one of the very oldest properties in the Douro Valley. Uh, part of the demarcation with, uh, there were actually three properties inside Krasno. So in 2015, uh, we have celebrated our 400 year anniversary. So this is uh, very, very special. Douro, it's a lot about, uh, you know, tradition and history and, and and we are there. We're the real people, you know. We've been. We, we, I was almost, I was almost born in the Doro. You know, but Doro has been in my blood and in my uh, DNA ever since I I'm a, I was a toddler, you know. And and the same with all my family. What makes it special is this: we we, as I mentioned to you, we've learned from the very beginning that potential of the Doro would also go through uh, through the dry wines mm -hmm. and here. Uh, I will tell you, Charles, I think I speak on behalf of all, every producer in the Douro. It's still, we're still scratching. We're still learning. But uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, Douro, in the Douro, we have what we call mountain viticulture. Uh, my uh, my winemaker uses an expression, which I think it's perfect. He says the Douro, it's a, when we come to the Douro and we, we're about to harvest, it's a, it's a puzzle. You know, mm -hmm. it's truly a puzzle because we have vineyards growing at river level, against uh, 550 meters in altitude. Mm -hmm. You have different sunny exposures, you have different soils, you know, transition from the schist close to the river. And as you move up, uh, it, there's a transition from schist to granite. I think uh, in my opinion, from every wine region in the world that I have visited, I think the Douro is where you have the, um, the full expression of uh, terroir and, uh, and, you know, and microclimates, you know, it's absolutely incredible. You can have the same variety, the exact same variety, but plant it at uh, a couple of hundred meters different in altitude and a little bit of sun exposure, different sun exposure, and you will get complete different results. And that's something that we invested a lot in the last um, uh, 15, 20 years with, uh, you know, seeing that the market and that there was a, a, a good potential for Doro wines, my father, again, using his vision, he, uh, we bought a little bit of land in the upper Douro, so in the Douro Superior. This is very close to the Spanish border. We're about uh, uh, 10 kilometers by river to the border. The secret here, if you will, where we have put a lot of investment and a lot of our attention is in vineyard management. You can have the best winemaker in the world. You can have the best facilities, high technology in your winery. The truth at the end is that without good raw material, without good fruit, there will be no miracles. You know, yeah. you have to have good raw material to make good wines, and this is where we this is where we invested a lot in the last 15, 20 years. Right now, as I mentioned to you, we are completely self sufficient in terms of fruit. So we have uh, two hundred and twenty hectares. We don't buy grapes or juice from other producers. This is extremely important um, for you to achieve what we think it's the most important thing for our wines, which is to have a consistency in quality. For us, what we want is when, when a new vintage comes out, we want uh, our consumers and wine lovers to open the new bottle, smell the wine and taste the wine, 
And what we really want is for them to go, yes, it's Crashto again. What vintages are you particularly fond of, of Quinta de Crosto from the last two decades? I would say that since uh, beginning of this century, I, I would have two or three vintages that for me are, are absolutely phenomenal. Although I have to say, you know, Charles, that when we, when we produce wine, we always say the best vintage has always been the last one. You know? Yes. <laughs> Everyone would tell you that. But in fact, in the Doro, um, funny enough, the, the, the last three vintages, you know, 17, well, even, even 17, 18 and 19, they have been extremely solid, you know, mm -hmm. and it's very, very, uh, they change quite a lot. 17, uh, it was very odd because 17 is where we, when we started our harvest, but my favorites would be, without any doubt, 2001, it's considered to be, for me, it's one of the most solid vintages. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, with ports, you know, I, I, I would have to say this, you know, of course we had vintage 2000, you know, and 2000 was super important because it was the, the decade, the, the century and the millennium. So it had to be declared as vintage port and, and so on. But I think I consider 2001 to be an outstanding, extraordinary vintage. Uh, again, 2011 for me is also one of those years that uh, has been remarkably good. And I would say another one that I would pick could be either 2005 or could be also 2017. Okay. Uh, among that. So, but these they change, they change quite a oh, lot. Yeah. And, and this is another thing, uh, uh, Charles. Of course, with, with port, it's a bit different because, as you know, vintage port will last forever. Uh, we still have uh, a lot of old stocks in in our library, but vintage port has a has a very fun evolution. You know, when it's very young, it's very live, very fresh, full of fruit, acidity, and all that. And then vintages they tend to shut down for a few years. Uh, they sort of what we call a, a dummy stage for a few years. And it, sometimes you think the wine is 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 going off or is dying, and suddenly the wine comes back again. So this is the evolution for vintage port. When it comes to dry wine, we uh, it's the same story again. We are we are still understanding and we're still learning the 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 true aging potential of our dry wines. Can you discuss the current releases that are available on the market today? Right now, we are with uh, in terms of dry wine. So the whites are usually very you know, the release one year after the vintage, so they're very very young. Mm -hmm. So we have the, a, a new project also in the Doro Superior, which is called uh, so the wine is called Crash to Superior okay. because it comes from the Doro Superior. So that we have the Crash to Superior right uh, white. Uh, we're now in the 2021 vintage, and this is a blend of uh, Viozinho and Verdelho, 50 50. Again, okay. indigenous indigenous white port varieties, mm -hmm. but this is um, barrel fermented. I think it's a fantastic wine. Oh, Price, yeah. quality, stunning. And I think it's, it's again, it's a wine that what it's uh, a pleasant surprise is that as a white wine, it's holding extremely well in the bottle. So it's a wine mm -hmm. that you could keep for another five, seven, ten years without any problem. It keeps its freshness and acidity. So this is really, really good. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the red side, so we have Crash to Doro Red, our standard wine. This is produced with, um, with fruit from the three different properties. But it's mainly uh, mainly a blend of uh, obviously um, Toriga Nacional, super important as a blend, uh, Tinta Rorish, which is known as uh, Tempranillo in um, in Spain, and known as Aragonés in the south of Portugal, uh, and then we have many many others. So we have Tinta Barroca, Tinta Francisca, uh, Tinto Cão, uh, lots of different varieties to play with. But these are blends that we do for the Douro Red. We have our uh, what I what I would call my uh, our most famous wine, which is the Reserva Old Vines. Uh, we are now uh, preparing the 2020. This is a wine that needs some bottling age, so it will be still a little bit young. But the Old Vines, the fun thing, as the name mentions, when we when we say Old Vines, you can immediately assume that we're talking about uh, uh, mixed planting, so mixed fruit. It's fruit salad. Okay. In our Reserva Old Vines, we have anywhere from uh, uh, 30 to 40 different varieties. And oh, wow. for us, it's impossible to tell you uh, the percentages because mm -hmm. it's, it's completely mixed. Reserve is a wine that has an enormous aging potential. It's fantastic. I usually say to people that when they, when they drink the Reserve, if they approach the Reserve, uh, ideally they should open the bottle three or four hours before they drink it. Okay. And they should pair with, uh, 
you know, strong dishes, you know, like game, venison, quail, uh, partridge, wild boar, you know, things like that, or strong cheeses. Mm -hmm. And you can even try the wine the following day. If you have something to enter open 24 hours later, you will see what happens. Mm -hmm. Above the Reserva, we have what we call our super premium wines, which are uh, single varietals. So every year we we produce 100% Toriga Nacional, 100% Tinta Horish, and since 2016, we've been adventuring with uh, Toriga Franca, which is another variety that, uh, that works extremely well as a single varietal, also important as a blend. These are what we call single varietal wines. And then we are releasing also what we call our iconic wines. So we have two uh, very old plots, uh, we call uh, centenary vineyards. So they were planted at the beginning of last century. So now 114, 116 years of age. Uh, one of them, which is probably the most famous one, it's our Vinha Maria Teresa. So vineyard means vineyard. Uh, Maria Teresa, as you can guess, it's the name of, um, of a girl. And this, she was the first granddaughter of my great grandfather. And this here, it's, it's Vinha Maria Teresa, all this part here, you see. So this is the way uh, uh, old plants are, are planted in the Douro. They are horizontally planted. So you can see here that we have a much higher density per hectare, but the yield is very, very low. Our Quinta do Crasto Vinha Maria Teresa, which is our iconic wine, released only when the quality is really there. But we can tell you that we have officially uh, 54 native varieties mixed in that vineyard. So <laughs> again, Charles, this is something that people don't understand. Say, how is this possible? We say, well, that's the way... That's the way the vineyards were planted in mm. the past. And that's, I, we consider this to be, we consider the old vines to be our, our most precious uh, asset in the Douro. It's absolutely unique. There's mm. no other wine region in the world that you will say, this is a 115 year old plant uh, with uh, 50, with 54 different varieties. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely unique. And then we have another one that it's very small, but it's called Vigna da Ponte, which means vineyard of the bridge. There's a Roman bridge very close to that vineyard. Uh, it's 1.9 hectares, so it's ridiculously small, but it produces wines of outstanding quality. Uh, one thing to mention, uh, Charles, that we didn't say at the very beginning, and I think this would be interesting to for people to know. Uh, so Quinta, as I said, it's the Portuguese word for vineyard or state. And the name uh, Crasto com- comes from the, the Latin castrum, which means a Roman fortress. So the Romans, the Romans were settled in this. Yeah, you can see the the shape of our property. As you can see, it looks like a, a volcano. You see, and we have, we have vineyards on the on the east part and vineyards on the left part. So when you look at this picture, you can imagine why the Romans would choose to uh, to settle this as a Roman fortress. It would be at the very top of the hill with three hundred and sixty degree view. And, uh, and that's it. It's, uh, uh, that's the origin, Roman fortress. And then apart from that, Charles, we also have uh, vintage ports. So we're currently with uh, 17 and 18 vintage, which are both high, high quality. And towards the end of this year, we are moving. We also have a colleta port. So this is a, a dated a dated uh, uh, colleta, a dated tawny, if you will. We're currently with 2003, which is outstanding. And already some... Uh, 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 barrel and aging and bottling aging. And uh, for this Christmas, so towards uh, October, we're going to launch, um, it's very small production also, but we're going to have 10, 20, 30, and 40 year old Tonys from Kansas. Okay. Coast. All right. Been very oh, small. Wow. Ports, but oh, yeah. This should be fun as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Tony Ports. Oh, yeah. Uh, what suggestions would you have? Uh, for someone interested in, you know, in, in, in running a winery? I would say my, my, my first advice would be um, you have to be patient. Mm-hmm. You have to be patient. Uh, and it depends. If you're starting from scratch, you have to be really patient because when you are obviously planting new, new vineyards, this will take, uh, will take a long time. It's yeah. uh, very interesting to see how uh, a certain variety behaves when it's very young. So usually when you when you do uh, new plantings, I would say that for the first three, four years, you don't you shouldn't expect anything to come out of there because they're very, very young. After the fourth, fifth year, you'll start making some uh, some good wines. but then it's just like um, it's just like a child, you know, going to uh, 
uh, to, to be a teenager and an adult, you know, you see that the, 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 the character is developing and, but again, you have to be patient. Of course. Of course. And, What's the future? So, you know, the, and, and trends you see, uh, not just for uh, the Duro, but also for Crossdog. With our current situation with 220 hectares, so roughly five, 500 acres, we, we don't want to, um, to grow anymore. So I think we've, we've reached the sweet spot in terms of production and, and you know, and volume that we want to make. Uh, it's, it's still, I think, in terms of winemaking and vineyard management, like I said before, honestly, I think this is still a learning process for all of us. We're still understanding and, under, and, and learning every day different things, you know, aging potential. Uh, the future, I think it's very bright in terms of the Doro and also for Krashto for two reasons. First, because the Doro wines, they will be in the, in the top. I, I have no doubt about that. We have quality. I think we have price. Uh, we have good value for money, uh, of course, and and then you can also have the very, very high end wines that you can can achieve as well. Do you have any tips for people that may want to visit? Right now we are what we call the high season, so yeah. summer. So I would say that uh, the high season for us it's actually extending now. So it will be uh, from May until late October. It's super packed. Mm -hmm. the first advice would be if you if anyone wants to come. My very first advice would be to uh, to take care of accommodation as soon as possible. So don't don't think that you're going to book for next week because it's it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's that's that's one of the things. There's great places for you to stay, but limited because there's you know the door is not exploding because of the world heritage. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing that uh, that I would say is you know we have amazing infrastructures. Doro is like I said, mountain viticulture. So we have whiny whiny roads mm -hmm. uh, but the best way to get around i would say you know if you want to go up just for one day or maybe two days you can take the train super fun we have outstanding infrastructures very good highways so you can get everywhere very easily safely uh, you are in the safest country in europe and the third safest country in the world what is one of the most memorable wines you've had recently in the last uh, 10 years i became uh, a very big fan of uh, Rieslings from Germany. Uh, I think these are some of the most amazing wines in the past. So I'm, I'm collecting a lot of Rieslings now. I think one of the best bottles that I have, that I had in my life, this was quite some time ago. It was in um, in Vancouver, British Columbia. So we're just having dinner and drinking the wines of the event and all that. And he goes under the table and he pulls a bottle of red that he had open and decanted. And uh, it was um, a 1952 uh, uh, Romani Coti. Oh, was, boy. Yeah. <laughs> that will be in my mind forever, forever mm -hmm. and ever. Well, Miguel, I, I really, really appreciate it. It was, you know, very enlightening conversation. Um, I've really, you. you know, really enjoyed learning your background as well as the mm, background of, of Crosto, your family's estate, uh, and the Duro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. I, I also want to thank you on my on my behalf, on behalf of my family and, and Krasto for this opportunity. If you enjoyed this interview and would like to learn more, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on interviews or topics you'd like to learn more about, please don't hesitate to leave a comment.